esteemed colleague, Professor John Lindale. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. It really is a pleasure to be here. Alan and I were just uh, uh, thinking back to the last one of these talks that we, uh, that we gave, which um, we think was in 2011, uh, which was in the midst of the, the crisis. Uh, so that also was a very challenging time, but certainly we're facing uh, different challenges now. So really our brief uh, this evening is to um, not really to provide the answers. I think anybody uh, who says they have all the answers in relation to Brexit and Trump uh, really isn't paying attention, but to uh, raise some questions and, uh, and be provocative. Uh, and the, the, the hope is uh, that then we will have a, a, a very good discussion. So I think the most important part of the evening uh, will be the discussion part. I'm going to begin uh, by telling a bad economics joke. It's a slightly risque uh, economics joke. Uh, if, uh, you might think that there could be such a thing, but uh, I think there <laughs> 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 but, but there is. But, but, but uh, I'm going to follow Martin's example uh, and, uh, and, and take the chance. So this little boy has been hearing a lot uh, about the economy and the economics, and he has no idea what it's all about. So he asks his dad, you know, what is this, this economy uh, I keep hearing about? Uh, and his dad, now his dad is a little sexist, I should, uh, uh, I should warn you uh, in advance. Uh, but any, and also any similarities to a recently elected uh, world leader is completely uh, coincidental uh, in this. Uh, but his dad, you know, thinks for a bit, uh, and he says, the economy is like this household. I provide the money, so I'm capital. Uh, your mother there directs the staff, so she's management. Uh, the maid that does all the work, uh, so she's labor. And you see your little baby nephew over there, he's the future. So the little boy wasn't very happy with this, particularly the bit about his nephew being the future, but he accepted it. And he went to bed that night, but he was woken up by a ter terrible racket uh, coming from his uh, little nephew's room. So he got up uh, to investigate. So first of all, he went to his parents' room, but his dad wasn't there, and he tried to wake up his, uh, his mother, uh, but he couldn't wake her up. And then he went down the, the hallway past the maid's room, and he saw his dad in the maid's room, entertaining the maid, uh, let us say. Uh, and then he finally went into his uh, little nephew's room, and he found out what the problem was, that his little nephew uh, was in uh, bad need uh, of a nappy change. So he said to himself, what kind of a... What kind of an economy is this? Management is asleep on the job. <laughs> Capital is screwing labor, and the future stinks. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so hopefully our future uh, uh, doesn't stink. And I'm actually going to start off uh, with, uh, to some extent, uh, the, the good news uh, in terms of the, the Brexit-Trump effect on uh, what forecasters uh, are um, uh, predicting for, for Irish growth. Uh, and here um, I'm looking at uh, uh, forecasts made by the, uh, the central bank uh, at different points in time. Um, going back before uh, we thought that uh, Brexit was going to happen and Trump was going to be elected. Uh, so back in April of last year, I think both of those events looked unlikely. And just seeing uh, the subsequent uh, forecasts since. Uh, I'm using the central bank because they came out with new forecasts for the, uh, uh, for the economy just last week. And I'm particularly looking at the forecasts they're making for, for 2017. Uh, so the forecast for 2017, this is real GDP growth, was 4.2% uh, back uh, in April of last year. And it certainly has come down over time. Uh, and I think this, in part, is reflecting uh, uh, particularly Brexit. Uh, I think uh, the Trump effect has really shown up. Uh, and the uh, prediction for growth for 2017 is now 3.3%. But it's not really as if the bottom has fallen out of growth, um, uh, the growth forecasts, uh, uh, but there, there certainly has been some decrease. But if we look at their forecasts uh, really for the labor market, and here we're looking at the forecast for the unemployment rate, actually the forecast unemployment rate for 2017 is actually lower now uh, than it was back uh, in April uh, 2016. And you could say that this is actually quite conservative. 
uh, in that the unemployment rate is already down to 7.1%. So at least in terms of job creation, uh, we certainly don't see the, the, the bottom uh, falling out of the Irish economy. But the thing about forecasts is really what they are, the, sort of it's the most likely outcome for the economy. So you can think of there being a distribution of possibilities uh, and really it's the mode uh, of that distribution, uh, the most likely outcome. But the concern, of course, relating to Brexit and Trump is the huge uncertainty in terms uh, of what could happen. Uh, so we have this distribution of possible outcomes and there's a lot of downside risk. The tails of that distribution have become uh, uh, very thick. Uh, and we can talk about there being uh, unusual uncertainty. Now, I, think, uh, I have to kind of catch myself a little bit when I talk about unusual uncertainty. Uh, in my work for the Fiscal Council, um, uh, we've been coming out with reports since uh, 2011, or it was with the Fiscal Council just up until the end of last year. And I think in every report, we not only talked about the high level of uncertainty in the Irish economy, but we said it was unusually high. If you're coming out year after year saying it's unusually high, uh, then it's probably a signal that uh, it's really not that unusual, but that uh, as uh, almost a norm, uh, uncertainty is incredibly high in the Irish economy. Now, actually, I think you can defend saying it's been unusual over that period, but for very different reasons. So back in 2011, uh, when we gave one of these talks before, there was huge uncertainty about how Ireland would come out of the crisis. It was really about, mainly about the domestic economy. We know that typically after recessions, economies tend to bounce back quickly, but there's evidence that after financial, a financial crisis, uh, that it can be much more prolonged, given the damage that's been done to balance sheets right across the economy, the banks, uh, businesses, households. Uh, so there was huge uncertainty about what the Irish recovery would, would, would look like uh, coming out of the crisis. As it turned out, uh, I think the, the economy uh, recovered quite well and better than many people expected. The uncertainty now is very different. It's really because of these external events, uh, really not knowing the form that Brexit's going to take or the crazy things that the new president of the United States might do. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it's much more uh, externally driven. Uh, so uh, uh, again, uh, un unusual, but uh, but for a different reason. And sort of the bad news is the reason these events, uh, Brexit uh, and, uh, and Trump, uh, are of such concern uh, and raise the possibility of such large down, downside risks is because of the unusual exposure uh, of the Irish economy really to these risks. Ever since uh, we adopted an outward-oriented uh, economic model uh, back uh, to T.K. Whitaker's uh, uh, work uh, mapping out that model in the late 1950s. Uh, the Irish economy, as you know, has become highly integrated uh, into uh, the uh, international economy. Trade is, if you add imports and exports together, is about 200% of GDP, uh, one of the highest in the world. Uh, and foreign direct investment, of course, is a huge part of the Irish economy, and I'm sure many of you uh, work for multinational companies. IDA uh, client companies account for 200,000 uh, um, uh, 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 jobs, essentially 10% of the total workforce. Um, of the, uh, the inward investment to the European Union, uh, Ireland uh, accounts for 4.3% uh, of that inward investment, uh, which is two and a half times the size of Ireland's share uh, in European Union uh, GDP. Uh, so very significant uh, part of the Irish economy. And essentially this combination of Brexit and Trump really gives the Irish economy a potential double hit. On the one hand, indigenous industry is very heavily reliant on, on the UK market. Overall, only about 14% of Irish exports go to the UK, but in industries such as the agri-food industry, uh, more than 40% of exports go to the UK. Uh, so indigenous industry could be particularly hard hit uh, by Brexit. Uh, and, of course, U.S. multinationals uh, are uh, key to Ireland's integration into global value or production chains. And even though some people deny uh, the importance uh, of Ireland's uh, corporation tax regime and how it uh, complements uh, the U.S. corporate tax regime, uh, I think uh, uh, the uh, corporate tax regime is uh, a significant part of uh, Ireland's competitive advantage. So there are uh, significant risks. 
So we have Brexit and we have Trump. I'm going to put two more uh, potential risks uh, and just get your thoughts on how you would uh, rank them. Uh, I'm going to throw in Europe uh, uh, and particularly risks uh, surrounding the Eurozone and the risks uh, relating to Europe are both economic and uh, political. Uh, on the economic side, I think Italy and its problems stand out, both its debt to GDP ratio uh, of about 140% uh, and also problems in its banking system. Uh, potentially a huge risk uh, to the Eurozone uh, and potentially an ex existential risk uh, to the Eurozone. And we've seen very significant political tensions uh, in the European Union, in, Union as well uh, with strong nationalist anti-EU forces in, in countries like France, the Netherlands, even Germany, all of which are having uh, elections this year. So Europe is a source of risk. Uh, and I'm going to throw in one more, uh, and this one uh, is one that you may, might not have thought of, but I think it is, is actually quite important. Anybody know who that gentleman is? Yeah, he's an American, not as notorious as uh, Mr. Trump. So he's actually, his name is uh, Larry Summers. He was uh, the Treasury Secretary uh, under President Clinton and the chair of uh, President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors past uh, president of Harvard University. The reason I put him up is that he's, he's popularized this idea recently of secular stagnation, which is that we've entered into a period of slow growth. Um, this could be because of demand side factors that we just, the advanced economies just can't generate sufficient demand uh, to use basically all their productive uh, potential. And that's the version of the story that uh, uh, Larry Summers has mainly pushed. But there's also a supply side version of the story, uh, and that is technological development uh, is producing much less growth than it did in the past. In the past, innovations such as uh, the internal combustion engine, electricity, even indoor plumbing, has been shown to have been incredibly fruitful in, in generating economic growth you know, decades after the uh, initial uh, inventions were made. Now we might think that we're in an, an era where there's incredible technological progress taking place. The fact that we have incredibly powerful computers in our pockets, uh, uh, our smartphones might lead you to, to think that this is uh, you know, a period uh, of very rapid technological development. But there's actually been a trend really going back to the 1940s of uh, uh, decade on decade growth actually slowing down uh, technology not able to, to generate the kind of growth uh, that it did in the past. Uh, so this is, is a very significant risk uh, to what the uh, uh, growth rates are going to be in the future. It's very hard to see the Irish economy growing strongly if the global economy is not growing strongly, and particularly if the countries uh, at the leading edge of the global economy are not generating the technological progress to, to drive that uh, growth forward. So I just want to ask you to, to think about what you think uh, uh, how you'd rank these risks from Brexit to Trump to Europe-related risks to secular stagnation. And you can actually, I think it's useful to think of two different dimensions. One is which of these could create a, cause another crisis in the Irish economy. And when I say crisis, again, something that involves a large recession, big falls in asset prices, uh, significant problems in the banking sector, loss of creditworthiness of the state itself, all the things that we saw uh, in the crisis that struck in, in 2008. Now, which of these could lead to a situation uh, like that uh, again? Uh, and then a second uh, dimension is which of these could cause you know, a period of prolonged slow growth being the biggest threat uh, to the long run development uh, of the Irish economy. So you might just want to just think about it for a second, uh, starting with the factors that are most likely uh, uh, to cause another crisis in the Irish economy. Anybody want to suggest how you would rank them? Brexit, Trump, Europe, or secular stagnation in terms of the crisis-related risk? I would say Brexit, Trump, Europe, Larry Summers, I don't know enough about it. We'll put him, put him off the list. OK. Uh, do you want to say just a little bit more about maybe why? <laughs> I do think that Ireland remains very strategic for many multinationals. And okay. even though um, 
the uh, corporation rate uh, or tax rate might have decreased, well, or will decrease most likely in the US, I think it will be the only factor that will okay. attract back some uh, multinationals that are here for very strategic reasons, ge geographically, you know. Yes. Also, the workforce in Ireland is very skilled now, you know, they have been trained, they have been invested in them for, for quite some time, so I, I do believe that. Um, and can I ask you, what, what about, so that's the investment that's already here, and you can see uh, why they would have put down roots. What about winning new investment? Uh, would you see that being more at risk if there were substantial changes in the U.S. Decrease, corporate tax? Yeah, yeah, I would think that it will continue. Uh, it might decrease, yeah. yeah. But I okay. think it will continue because, again, you know, Ireland is just the, an open door to the rest of Europe. And, again, if you want to grow on, as a multinational, you know, worldwide, obviously, or globally, you, you do need, you know, a presence in other uh, Okay. Uh, very good. Any other thoughts? Uh, what would you put on top of your list in terms of something that could actually cause a crisis in the in the Irish economy? I, I would say the euro could be most likely to cause a crisis. Okay. Uh, expand. Yeah, you have to look a little bit more strategically. Uh, there's a decline in time in which Trump is probably going to be in power. So the large strategic decisions will be put on hold or will be diversified over the next four years. The Brexit thing, the relationship is so intertwined and cultures are so intertwined, it's going to be hard to separate separate those two so much. But I think the euro the crisis in Europe, <coughs> which we are probably most linked to, mm. have big effect. Big effect, and possibly particularly through the to the eurozone, yes. uh, given uh, uh, our one, use of the euro. One other destabilization in the monetary funds in Europe will possibly um, cause complete devaluation of the euro for even the standard. Very good. Uh, yeah, maybe just take take one more. I think you. So your hand. Yeah. My example would be the banking or the internet because if that goes, you can do nothing. Like recently, I just had two friends who you know, had no access to internet and they literally couldn't watch TV. They couldn't, you know, do anything. So. So so, so you would put something different from this particular list. Uh, so some sort of yeah, technological sort of communications of breakdown. Yeah. Okay, and uh, what would you see as leading to a collapse of the uh, of the internet? Is it uh, some sort of cyber attack? Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Yeah, and this, certainly this is a, uh, a very limited list. Let me just sort of give you uh, sort of my ranking on this, uh, and I should say that this could change by the day. Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so I actually did put Europe on top as well, because again, if you, if you think about what could actually cause a crisis, you know, it's hard, uh, it's not impossible to sort of imagine Brexit and, and, and Trump sort of leading to the kind of crisis that we, uh, that we had back in 2008, uh, but certainly problems that led uh, to concerns about the uh, continued viability of the Eurozone and, uh, and the Euro uh, currency itself. Uh, 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 would certainly uh, bring the Irish economy back into a crisis situation. Um, uh, Brexit, partly because uh, uh, Brexit itself uh, uh, could have a destabilizing uh, effect on Europe, uh, particularly given the importance of London as a financial center uh, uh, for Europe. Um, you could certainly see Trump doing things uh, that could lead to a global uh, uh, financial crisis, particularly if there was a uh, a collapse of, uh, of, of world trade and the collapse of international economic uh, cooperation, so I certainly wouldn't rule it out. And even secular stagnation, one result of secular stagnation is that central banks have brought interest rates essentially down as low as they can go, essentially uh, down to zero. That can lead to a reach for yield on the part of investors as they take riskier investments because uh, interest rates have, have, have gone so low that itself can create conditions that can cause a crisis. And if a crisis then occurs, given that interest rates can't go any lower than they are at the moment, uh, governments uh, uh, don't have the instruments that they need to actually fight the, the, the crisis, uh, uh, and uh, it, it could easily begin feeding on itself. Uh, let me just turn then to the, to the growth risk ranking. So here we're, we're looking longer term and thinking of these four uh, which would you see as being potentially the thing that you sh would be most concerned about as adversely affecting the, the longer-term growth and development of the Irish economy? Thoughts on this? How would you, how would you rank it at the four now? Uh, maybe the same, different? It has to be the stagnation, purely because a lot of the economies in the world are part of the money. So um, the, it's sort of both a false sense of well-being, that's, you know, there's money being pumped down the market, etc. 
Yeah, so. Great minds uh, think alike. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so you're uh, focusing on a sort of a particular uh, dimension and the uh, financial interrelationships that exist that, that tie everybody together. I suppose I was thinking just more about, you know, if we really have entered in, into this era uh, of low growth because we can't generate the demand or technology. Uh, is not, not generating the uh, fruitful innovations that drive growth. Uh, I think that over any uh, uh, period, uh, any reasonably long period of time that we might look at is going to dominate uh, all uh, these events that very much uh, preoccupy us in the moment. Uh, for Trump next, uh, I actually probably disagree maybe a little bit uh, with you in terms of the kind of risks to Ireland's uh, foreign direct investment uh, based model uh, I think the corporation tax is a big part of the, of the uh, competitive offering, certainly not the only part, uh, but to the extent, and I'll come back to this, that that uh, could uh, change fairly radically under Trump, and not mainly, I think, because uh, of the uh, intention to lower the U.S. corporation rate. It's the entire structure uh, of the U.S. corporation uh, uh, tax system that might change, and, uh, and uh, it's not just Trump that's pushing it in the context of the U.S., but uh, it's very much... Uh, 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 part of uh, the Republican Party's uh, uh, economic policy platform. Brexit, of course, uh, uh, because of the adverse effects that it has on trade, and I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, and in this case, I would see Europe at the, at the bottom of the list. Again, I wouldn't uh, 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 completely downplay how slow growth in Europe um, uh, could adversely affect uh, growth in the Irish economy, given that we're tied to it. But in some ways, slow growth in Europe leads the European Central Bank to keep interest rates very low, which is actually supportive uh, of, uh, of growth here. Uh, so I've put it at the end of my list. But I think it's useful just to, to think uh, about how you would uh, rank these different elements. The economic effects of Brexit. And did economists get it wrong? If you remember back uh, prior to the referendum, economists were saying that Brexit was going to be really disastrous, not only in the, in the long run, but in the, in the short run as well. Uh, and the UK economy, and as we've seen, the Irish economy have actually performed you know, quite well uh, since, uh, uh, since Brexit. Uh, and it's put economists very much on the defensive. So in the short run, economists are really talking about anticipation effects, because of course Brexit hasn't, hasn't happened. Uh, Article 50 hasn't even been triggered uh, uh, as yet, so it's kind of looking into the future. Uh, and some of the effects, some of those anticipation effects were going to be positive, uh, such as the, the, the very significant depreciation of sterling, uh, which has given a big competitive boost uh, uh, to uh, the traded sector of the, of the UK economy. Uh, it also uh, worsens their terms of trade in the sense that they have to give more exports uh, 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 to pay for the imports that they get, so it actually makes them poorer. Uh, but in the short run, that competitiveness effect dominates. If there's lower long-run income as a result of Brexit, that should make people again feel poor and it could lead to lower consumption in the present. That should be negative. But the big thing that people thought was going to happen was that the uncertainty related to Brexit uh, was going to cause a lot of postponements of investment. Uh, and that investment is a very uh, important source of demand. Uh, and that would slow uh, the, the, the UK uh, economy. And that was considered to be the big one and to be negative. And that really doesn't seem to have happened to the extent that the economists uh, thought it would. Then there's also some questions about what the policy response was going to be, uh, what particularly the Bank of England were going to do, and what they did once Brexit happened is that they really lowered interest rates uh, and that uh, was positive for the UK economy and I think partly explains some of the strong performance. But, it, but economists do seem to have got that wrong and there's seem still some uh, puzzles about that, but that shouldn't, I think, take away from where the most agreement uh, uh, existed amongst economists. That was the negative long-run effects of Brexit. Uh, and this is really based uh, on uh, a body of evidence uh, uh, called gravity models or gravity equations. Uh, and this just looks at empirical evidence of the bilateral trade flows between either countries or, uh, or different regions. And the reason they're called gravity models is that it predicts that the greater the economic mass given by the product of the GDPs uh, of the two uh, regions or countries, uh, the, the greater the trade will be. And trade is inversely proportional to the distance uh, be, uh, between the two entities. Um, but also, it shows 
that borders can have a huge effect on the amount of trade that takes place. Uh, and a classic study actually looked at trade both between Canadian provinces and between Canadian provinces and US states and then between US states. And so once you controlled for the economic masses and the distance between the different trading partners, trade, at least in the early studies, trade between two Canadian par provinces was 22 times greater than, than trade between uh, a Canadian province uh, and a US uh, state. Another way of looking at it, it implied that the, the border was equivalent, just at the border itself, to a distance of 10,000 miles. So distance itself adversely affected trade, but borders had a huge effect on trade. And the extent to which borders affected trade was very much dependent on the kind of trade policies that existed. Uh, so being part of a single market, being part of a customs union, tended to reduce that, that border effect. So for instance, when NAFTA was put in place, that number 22 dropped down to 12. So it had a huge effect uh, on the amount of trade that was taking place. It was almost like the, that, that uh, uh, border was, uh, was shrinking. So trade barriers seem to massively affect the amount of trade that takes place. And then there is other evidence that shows that the amount of trade that's take, that takes place or how integrated the economy uh, is into the international trading system, uh, the faster the, the growth will be. So for every 1% reduction in trade that uh, over the long term uh, reduces uh, uh, productivity in the economy by about a third of a percentage point. And there's quite a bit of evidence showing that. So this is really why economists were so, so pessimistic about Brexit. They really saw Brexit, again, depending on the form that it took, but particularly if it took a hard form, which it looks like uh, it's heading towards, was going to significantly affect the amount of trade that takes place uh, and ultimately affect the uh, performance of the economies. And I don't think economists have at all changed their mind on that, uh, despite getting the, the short-term effects uh, somewhat wrong. Some Brexit-related questions that we might sort of pick up on uh, in discussion, and it's sort of time to get into them uh, here. One question is, what approach should the Irish government take uh, in the Brexit negotiations. Uh, one thing that's been pushed, I really should put a question mark there because I didn't mean to make that as, as, as a statement because <laughs> actually that's not a good idea. Uh, uh, but one thing that's been pushed, for instance, by a retired Irish diplomat, um, uh, Ray Bassett, is that to really have power in those negotiations, Ireland needs to be willing to walk away from the European Union itself. Uh, should Ireland be threatening that uh, in order to try to uh, influence uh, uh, those negotiations. Another question is how aggressive should the government be in targeting potentially mobile UK investments? Uh, uh, should we take the risk of being uh, labelled as a, a vulture jurisdiction? We can certainly see the IDA is very sort of ad hoc, uh, uh, very uh, uh, gung-ho, excuse me, uh, and, and uh, really going after that investment. But are there risks associated with that? We already see uh, the Northern Ireland government uh, getting a little upset uh, at uh, uh, at the aggressive approach uh, that uh, uh, the Irish government has been, has been taking. Um, so uh, maybe that's something we could discuss as well. Something uh, that I used to think an awful lot about uh, when I was on the uh, Fiscal Council is the appropriate fiscal policy. And recently read a very well-renowned and very good economic commentator uh, talking about the need to provide supports to affected industries uh, give the economy a boost through investments, and stay fiscally strong. Uh, now, those uh, are not necessarily uh, consistent. Uh, uh, so uh, should Ireland really try to stay fiscally strong so that it would be resilient in the face of any kind of shock that might hit it, keeping the deficit low and the debt on a downward path? Uh, or should it be willing to push the envelope a bit, uh, particularly on the capital investment side, uh, to try to boost the economy, given uh, that you have these negative forces uh, affecting the economy as well? And very last slide. Uh, the economic consequences of President Trump, who really knows, uh, you can see different effects. Initially, uh, the fiscal stimulus that could come from his increased uh, capital investment uh, and also the tax cuts could be a boost, a demand side boost to, to the US economy and uh, a boost potentially to the global economy. One thing that I think you'll have to watch out for uh, is that the kind of policies that he's uh, proposing are likely to lead to an appreciation uh, of, the, of the US dollar, which is going to affect the competitiveness of manufacturing industry, the very types of jobs that he's trying to uh, protect. 
We saw something very similar happen uh, during the Reagan years, where again there was a big boost to the economy through, through tax cuts, of, of large appreciation of the dollar. And it was really the, the period where the deindustrialization of the US economy really was, was most intense. Uh, so he could uh, face a backlash from his, from his own supporters. I think there's a real potential risk uh, of uh, a trade war, uh, whether it's with China, already huge threats made against Mexico, threatening to put a 20% uh, uh, tariff on their imports if they don't uh, pay for the wall. <laughs> he, he's already uh, uh, sort of pulled out of the Trans-Pacific uh, uh, Partnership. Uh, I doubt very much that TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, is going to go ahead. Uh, and uh, uh, NAFTA, which also in includes Canada, and we've already talked about uh, how uh, NAFTA uh, really supported um, the increase in trade on the North American uh, uh, continent, uh, that's at risk as well. And then there are the possible implications for foreign direct investment by US multinationals. Uh, as I uh, alluded to earlier, I don't think the main concern here is the reduction uh, in uh, the US corporation tax rate, even though that certainly would change uh, the incentives uh, that uh, multinationals uh, faced in terms of foreign direct investment. But there's a big push towards what's called a destination-based corporation tax which is quite complicated, and uh, there's lots of different uh, details to be decided, but essentially it involves not taxing exports from the US, so when it's actual activity in the US, the exports from that activity are not taxed, uh, but taxing imports, uh, and including imports from you know, foreign branches uh, of those companies. That could dramatically change the incentive uh, to locate activity either in the US uh, or to engage in foreign direct investment. I think there's a very significant push on uh, for that. I wouldn't be at all surprised to see uh, that happening uh, in some form. So the sort of environment that we've become used to uh, that's determined uh, the incentives for FDI and which Ireland has been such a huge beneficiary uh, could undergo uh, a fairly significant change. Uh, so uh, that is certainly something, something to watch out for. I am going to stop there and uh, turn it over to, to Alan.